this is the first of our um, fantasy and science fiction genre talks. Um, we hope to do more both with this genre and um, also look at some other genres. So um, we've each selected a few works. Um, some of them are going to be available on Overdrive and some of the other ones you can either purchase from Ministry or Amazon. Um, so just some things to discuss that we have enjoyed that we have read recently. Um, so Aaron, I guess I will let you start with, we can either okay. do one each or go through our I'll whole I'll do, set. I have a, I'll do a slide. So I'll do okay. one slide and then we could go to someone Thanks. else. Um, but I also want to add that we're hoping to pull out our sci-fi fantasy readers that are in Meredith and beyond. Um, because I noticed when we circulate our books for sci-fi and fantasy don't go out as well as our audiobooks. Our audiobook selection tends to go out more for that genre. So it's kind of interesting and be curious to see um, who we get for that. So I'm pulling up my slide and I wanted to talk about when I first became a, a sci-fi reader. And in third grade, Mrs. Thomas used to read to us every day after lunch, and she liked to read Roro Dahl to us. And so in hearing Roro Dahl, I think that's what made me a reader, was all her stories that she read to us. And so I would go to the library and start checking things out. But fourth grade is when it all really kicked in, because everybody in fourth grade was reading the Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, we went through those pretty quickly. And we were also reading the Lloyd Alexander series with the High King. And for those, course, did you read those too, Matthew? Um, so my first entry into those were it was actually one of the first books of that length that um, my brother had read to him and then started reading out loud on his own. So that was my first encounter with them. And then I want to say a couple years ago, I re-listened to the audiobooks for them, and I thought better than many things from that era, they have held up fairly well. Oh, you know what? I never thought of listening to them again in audio, mm. but I think I would. I think the Black I Cauldron was that. a big one. Oh, I think you'd like it, Linda. So the Chronicles of, the, of what is it? Raiden, Prydain, thank you. What's that about? Can you give it a basic So it's premise? based on Welsh mythology. Um, it's not a direct analog for it, like it is just a fictional work, but um, it's clear that Lloyd Alexander did a lot of research for it. And I think in like the opening of a couple of them, he even talks about some of the themes that are discussed and how they might've been dealt with in Welsh mythology. So I definitely recommend it. Um, it's a good read, pretty quick read. Um, they are, I, I do believe they're intended for older elementary, middle school, Matthew. I just remember I reading so, yeah. these in fourth and fifth grade. And then I know wrinkle, all of the yeah. audiobooks are on available on Overdrive. I don't recall with the ebooks. Oh, that's good to know. Wrinkle in Time. I, all the girls in fourth grade were reading this. I don't know why the boys were not reading A Wrinkle in Time. And that was really, I think, my first sci fi sort of book, more so than a fantasy sort of book. And there's a couple in the series beyond this but this one was really the best one and I did do it when I was a teacher with my third and fourth grade class and I think there's a movie of it now. Yeah, it just came out recently like last year I think by Ava Duver DuVernay. It's supposed to be good. Yeah so I, I just wanted this was what I wanted to start with because this is really when I, I started being a fantasy and sci-fi reader. So uh, let me get out of that. Okay. And who wants to go next? Let's go, Matthew. Go for it, Linda. Oh, okay. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> um, sure. So I... One sec. So all the books I am discussing at the moment have sort of a theme to them. Um, wasn't necessarily intentional and not necessarily something that I will continue, um, but all of the books that I have for today um, deal with the idea of gods in fantasy novels. Um, and 
kind of what interested me about it is how each author has a different take for how they interact with the world with these beings that can sort of alter reality. Um, so Fate of the Fallen is a book where the protagonist, um, his best friend is supposed to be the savior of the world who has been chosen by fate and the gods to um, save them from this terrible fate. Um, and within the first few pages, not a spoiler, it's on the back cover, this chosen figure dies. And so it's his best friend trying to um, make the best of it when you have these powerful wizards and even other gods being like, yeah, I wouldn't even bother. Like, this is how fate works. You're just doomed. Um, <laughs> and so it was interesting to see these quote unquote supreme beings being like, yeah, we're tied to this too. We, we can't do anything. Uh, we just kind of have to let things play out. Um, and then like they do have a very regular interaction with the characters. There are several chapters that are dealt with from the perspective of gods and um, just to have them be powerful, but at the same time, not all powerful is something that I think um, is an interesting investigation in fantasy um, books and one which I will discuss further uh, with my next book. That's very interesting. Actually, I have something that kind of fits that. Um, let me get my PowerPoint ready. Uh oh, wait. I have two monitors and it keeps flipping. So let me share my screen first. Uh, not that one. Where is Zoom? Can you see this? Yep. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to switch ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. So The Quantum Thief by Hanu Rajaniemi. Uh, he's one of my favorite sci-fi artists. Now, this is really hard sci-fi. It kind of throws you in and expects you to understand the world by immersion. At first, I was like, whoa, and I actually, there was a glossary online. I was, like, keeping up with it and taking notes. But once you get into it and uh, get the hang of it, it's so good. Um, and they're also kind of gods in this one, um, but they're also kind of actually corporate. I don't want to spoil it, but... Um, so anyway, it begins in, on Mars in Oubliette, which is a prison, and every day he wakes up and has to kill himself, and he's broken out of prison, and then he has to solve this murder, which is a murder of a chocolatier, and it deals, uh, this is also called, by the way, the Jean Le Flambeur trilogy, because um, there's three books in the series, very good. Um, and it also deals with a lot in the future, like uh, there's a moving city in Mars, and all the memories are kept in the cloud. And so it's him hacking into memories to try to solve this mystery in the first one. Um, it's very fascinating and I really uh, like his books. I have another one on my to read uh, with me here called Summerland. Oh, can you see that? And yep. I also have one by him, which is a collected fiction, short stories, which was really good. Um, awesome cover, by the way. Uh, so he's one of my favorite science fiction artists artists, authors, and I would highly recommend that one. Um, but it is, like I said, it's it's hard to get started in. You just have to kind of uh, let it sink in, and once in a while, it, it will click eventually, and you'll be like, this is amazing. My favorite character was the, the ship that has a personality. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but that's interesting, because Dune was like that for me. I had a really hard time getting into Dune. I think it, maybe if there was some sort of internet where I could go on and look things up, I, I may have enjoyed that book more. I know other people really love that series. Yeah, I found I a, a hard glossary time page, it. a wiki page that had a glossary of terms for this for this book. But um, even when you kind of don't know what's going on, it's interesting. And finally, at one point, it clicks. Um, so would you say it's a sci-fi mystery? Is it a, a blend? The first one is. And then it kind of okay. gets, it expands and expands. Yeah. I don't want to give too much away, but it's really good. And you said it's a trilogy at this yes, point? Yes, Jean Le Flambeau. Completed. Yes, it is completed. And Henri Rajaniemi, I believe he's a physicist. Um, he's a very smart guy. Um, you know what? Now I don't trust myself and I'm going to Google that. I don't want to make false claims here. But he is well, one of my She favorites. is Googling that. Did you want to go with your next one, Aaron? Sure. So, let me pull that up. Advanced mathematics. Okay. He's very smart. 
So my next, I went, I, I organized by sci-fi fantasy topics. So my next one are, are classics. And these, I, I read uh, some of them, I would say high school, but one of them, I just read for the first time, The Picture of Dorian Gray. We actually did that for a book group. And I picked these out because some classics, they just, they lose, uh, they lose over time, they're hard to read. But I feel like these four, you could read at any time. Frankenstein, I've read several times uh, and I did the audio with it and it's excellent. And it's interesting because when you watch the movie as a kid, you're terrified, you know, the monster's the evil one. But as you get older and you read the book, it's the doctor that you really start to dislike quite a bit. And I remember when we were studying it in college, we talked about how it was really a story of child abandonment that he created this monster that, well, created this person really, and was so upset by how it came out. He just left him on his own to figure life out. And life was very harsh to him. Uh, Fahrenheit 451, which I always called it Fahrenheit 451. And then I listened to the audiobook narrated by Ray Bradbury. And he called it Fahrenheit 451. And he said he got the title because he had written the book and he wanted to know what temperature paper burned at and he called the fire chief and I want to say it was in New York New York City and he just said hey what temperature does paper burn at and the fire chief said Fahrenheit 451 and he just hung up the phone oh. and so the, that's what he he named it and he said he always hoped that the fire chief was correct it was interesting he was in the library and didn't ask the librarians but he was in the library for the most part when he wrote this book or typed it up so this one it was almost scary how much of society is very similar to our own, including his vision of what the internet virtual gaming may have looked like. Uh, there's like this virtual home where you have all the walls and it's like you're immersed in whatever the show is. It's really neat if you haven't read it in a while. And then Slaughterhouse Five, I, I think everyone goes through this Kurt Vonnegut phase. I don't know if you guys did, but uh, yeah, in, yeah, I've read college. like half a dozen by him, I think. And so Slaughterhouse Five is a bit of a difficult read i guess but i think it's it's my favorite but it it i'm really into time travel that's probably my favorite sci-fi topic and this is time travel but this it's like he lives his life in this not in a linear fashion so you know he'd be in world war ii then he'd be in the future it's really neat and if you're looking to start a kurt, kurt vonnegut that's where i would start and that's it for me on that one. I love Frankenstein. It's my favorite. I read it three times for three different classes. I love it too. Me and too. I love it. I think also the child abandonment, it could also be what some people feel like um, abandonment by a god or something, like going Matthew's topic. Um, uh, also, um, the last, oh, for, Fahrenheit 451. They just made a new show on, I think, on HBO. Oh, really? I have an idea. Um, yep. Oh, I'll have to look for it. And yeah. I think it's Matthew's turn now. Yeah. Um, so for my next uh, book, let's see if I can find the screen to share. Our product placement. Um, so City of Stairs is another book that deals with gods. Um, and its premise starts with um, humans have killed most of their gods. Um, and this is sort of a mystery of, um, I believe they're murders of humans. It's been a while since I've read the first one um, that are going on in this city that used to be a holy city. Um, and it turns out that in some ways, not even necessarily the God himself, but a reflection of him or something that has lingered of that God is still existing there and it creates it continues to warp reality in some interesting ways. So again, I think, I guess I was on a kick to see like these all powerful beings, what does the world look like after they have abandoned it um, and humans are trying to sort of make do in their place. And there are definitely some people who are like, man, I wish the gods would just come back. Um, but then there are also, um, reasons for why they didn't um, want them back. So like the initial rebellion was created because the gods determined that something was blasphemous and they killed um, a character's lover. And um, he went on to find a way to punish those gods for 
that um, evil act and because then it became a matter of um, self-preservation the other gods turned against him and um, he continued to fight them and ultimately won that war um, but then being a human he has died this is hundreds of years later and it's sort of how do they deal with this new landscape it's interesting and that one is available on Overdrive as an ebook. Um, mm -hmm. So if anyone is interested on it, on that page, it had the link to the Overdrive link. And Matthew, you said that was a series? Yep. So that, again, it's a trilogy. Um, so the first book I mentioned is the first of a series. Um, the second one has not been published yet, but um, this one, the complete trilogy, has been completed. And I feel like there might be murmurings of him creating other things in that sort of world that he created. Um, but I think the or original trilogy is pretty well established as a finished item. Thank you. Linda, you are muted. Okay. You are I was <laughs> muting because my dad walked in. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. But um... I couldn't see him in your dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's why that's there. Um, just going back to what Aaron said about the, the video game, Virtual Worlds, uh, in Quantum Thief, there's actually this culture that was built in and you, you piece it together. You're like, oh, they used to be video game guilds together and now they're like their own culture. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, okay. So my next book I would, since you, I'm going to, I will bring this up. I'm messing up my words right a little bit. Share screen. Um, current slide. Okay. You see it okay? Yes. Yep. Spider light. Now this takes you in the mind of a spider. There's one character where you're, uh, okay, so there's this little group. It's like a D&D &D group that kind of feels like it has this D&D &D feels and they're going in to, on a mission to save the world. And um, at one point they find a sentient spider and he helps them and he becomes a part of their party uh -huh. and he's transformed into a human. And then you get his POV, and it's actually really, really good. I know people don't like spiders, but um, it's by Andrew Tchaikovsky, and he has a lot of good sci-fi and stuff, too, that he's written. Um, Do you think we might like spiders more after reading it? Yeah, you might. I, I really liked it. It was different. Um, it was very different. Okay. I think that is one of the cool things about fantasy and sci-fi, just how different like early on, if you establish sort of rules for this is how this world is going to work, um, just how unique a world you can create. Um, yeah, yeah. And the rest and of it is very it. fantasy, like they're on a quest, they're a D&D, &D, almost a D&D &D feel, but it's very well written. And um, uh, I don't think it's on Libby, I've looked, um, but I think you could probably order it from Ministry. So I'll stop my screen share. Okay. Um, go to my next slide. And so dragons. And I think every preteen or teen goes, de girls anyway, I don't know, maybe boys too, goes through this dragon phase. And for me, it was the Dragon Riders of Pern, starting with Dragonflight. And the, it's interesting because when you first read the Pern novels, they're, they're, they seem like fantasy, but as you go further into them, it's actually sci-fi. It's a, um, a, a technology-driven story. And I, I liked in, the, in Pern the relationship between the riders and the dragons and how they were linked emotionally. And I burned out on dragons, and then I came upon His Majesty's Dragon. And this is by far my favorite dragon series ever. And it's kind of a blend of historical fiction and fantasy in that it takes place during the Napoleonic Wars and it, and it follows history pretty accurately, but there's this air core of dragons and the dragons are enormous and they, there's some smaller ones, but the, the battle dragons are big and they have their own crew, almost like a bomber crew that, uh, you know, they'll, they fight, they, they engage each other like they're on ships, you know, they'll jump and take each other's dragon. But the best part, similar to Pern, is the relationship between the rider and the dragon and how they're linked emotionally forever. So much so that the riders don't even marry 
because their relationship is completely with the dragon. That's their, they're forever linked. And of course the dragons live much longer than the humans. And there's one dragon in one of the books that uh, he's, he's really old and he's going blind, but he's still clutching the portrait of his rider you know, in a frame, he, you know, he can't even, he doesn't even know what it looks like anymore, Aww. but he knows that's his rider. It's that's very so emotional. Sad. There really is a lot of emotion in them, and the, the dragons are very intelligent and very feeling. So I, I highly recommend that series. Yeah, and I then, of course, yep, I'm sorry, go ahead, Matthew. four books into that series. Um, like, I've been listening to them interspersed amidst other things. They're now excellent it's, in it's audio. during the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars, right? Yes. Yep. So they're narrated by Simon Vance, who is my favorite narrator. I'll listen to anything if he's narrating it. And his voice doing the characters, you know, if you try to read the book, that's the only voice that you ever hear. So he's, it's fantastic. It's one of the ones as the series goes on, they're not quite as good. You know, I think the first three or four are really the best ones, but I still read on anyway, because I need to know what happens to everyone. Yeah. And then of course, yeah, I've Game heard of the Thrones. fifth is a bit of a clunker. So that's kind of why I've held off on reading the next one. I guess that one's in Australia, maybe, because go, they travel around the world to different locations and different things that are happening in history. Yes, each book is a different country, and you learn about China. I think South America is in there at one point. Uh, Turkey was in there. And then, of course, the dragons in each area are a little bit different as well. So, yeah, the Australian one, I guess in every series you have a clunker, but you have to read them all to get the whole picture of all the characters. So I wouldn't skip any of them. And if you're listening to them by some advance, they're going to be really good anyway. Uh, and then they go to Thrones, Egypt because, you know, Napoleon, Egypt. Were they in Egypt, Matthew? I don't remember them there. I know they're, they're further south in Africa in the one that I just finished, which mm-hmm. is the fourth one. But um, at least in the first four, they haven't been to okay. Egypt. I don't like, remember them there. Um, so the Battle of Trafalgar, for instance, um, happens off screen during the same time another battle is happening in the air so like they keep a lot of the historic things as Um, happening but they are not happening generally in the same place as the dragons and so i guess the war with austria that sort of like napoleon still wins it in a very significant fashion um, but they change how he does that by incorporating in dragons so and of course, he has his own dragon as well. So uh, it, it just puts a whole different twist. And I love historical fiction. And so to tie the two together, is, it's a lot of fun. And then finally, the third of that, to me, even though it's not all about dragons, I like the dragon element to the, the Game of Thrones series. So that's my dragon slide. So... I am going to cede my spot momentarily because um, <laughs> Linda also, I believe, has a Naomi Novik title. Yes, um, I do. Title do we have the same one? She has written some, like, I've read a lot of what she has written, and at least it seems like she has two very distinct um, genres, at least um, with her dragon fiction um, and then with the book that Linda is going to talk She's about. She's very good writer i've liked every book that i've read of hers i haven't read the dragon series yet though ironically um you have to i know let me share my (laughs) screen uh one second share from current slide and i lost track of my zoom can you see this yes okay i'm always never sure um uprooted by naomi Naomi novik uh is about a village and every God, it's been kind of a little bit since I've read this, but um, there's one what girl from the village is always chosen to be this guy's apprentice uh, and to protect the village and stuff. And she does magic. And now that I'm talking about it, I realize I don't remember as much as I, but than I thought I did, but it was really good. <laughs> I might have a reread. Um, also by um, Naomi Novik is uh, her newest book. I can't remember. Do you remember the title, Matthew? Because you read it too. Spinning Silver? Yes, that one's really good too. That one's set, um, it's like a retelling of Rapunzel, but it's not, um, she kind of, uh, yeah, I would, it's, it's really good. I would say in both, um, like she takes the interaction of 
a group that would classically be a villain in sort of folklore and like doesn't turn them into the hero but creates a much more nuanced position for them yes like um in uprooted it's sort of the trees are growing and taking over everything and corrupting everything um and the protagonist and her mentor are both wizards who have to go and like burn down the forests. Um, but the more you learn about the forests and like the forest spirits, they're, they're still doing terrible things, but they come off as much more sympathetic by the end of it. And so like, I think there's a good interplay of um, morality and how trying to do the right thing if you don't have like a full perspective on things um you can often be doing the opposite and spinning yep. silver does that some yes. as well for i forget what they are called but like the elven people of the frozen world um i don't remember what they're called either but yes they're elven folk yeah it turns out like they're really harsh and can be evil in some very specific ways, but also like you find out why it doesn't just give you that trope, and you get more of an in-depth, um, three sixty feel, uh, more in-depth, complex. There's more complexity she adds to them. I think modern what, fantasy does that, you know, because when you read the older fantasy, and I, I'm gonna have a slide of that, that that clear good versus evil. There's a bad guy, but you don't really know why are they so bad. So I like the, the fantasy where I do. I like sympathy. the complexity. Um, yeah. Yes. And uh, I'm just going to peek because there is one I had that has a little time travel uh, that and I was going to bring that up real quick. Uh, just real quick. Like, this is a young adult book. Um, let me I always have trouble sharing my screen. I'm sorry. So this is Furyborn, and it starts with two girls. Um, one is supposed to be the Blood Queen, one is supposed to be the Sun Queen. And the one, it starts with, uh, oh my god, I can't remember her name. But the main character, and she's all prepared to be the Sun Queen, and then it turns out it's not as straight cut as you think, and there's time travel, and um, I am on book two. The book three is coming out soon. It is very good. I don't want to spoil too much, but... Um, uh, this is for young adults, but it can be enjoyed by everyone, I think, um, from teens up. Uh, so I would read that. Ooh, Quantum Thief is back up on accident. So I'm running a smooth sailing ship here. So but would you, you say it's more fantasy and more sci-fi? Furyborn is fantasy. Yeah. That's high, okay. that's straight fantasy. Okay. So the next author I was going to talk about, and this has a bit to do with the idea of sort of like mixed morality, um, and see if- I knew he had it when I went to go see if it was <laughs> in the library, and I'm like, Matthew has this. And you said that for you, it isn't mirrored? Is that accurate? No, we can is see it. readable? It's, yes, <laughs> yeah. we can read it. But it, it is a weird thing for Zoom that as you're looking at your own image, it's entirely unreadable. Um, but N.K. Jemison is the author I was going to talk about, and I still- have yet to start that book. Sorry, Linda, that I'm going to hold on to That's it for okay. a bit. Um, We're in quarantine. But I do have a, so I have read a couple other books by her. Um, I've read the first of her, I believe it's called the Broken Earth Trilogy, um, which is sort of what she's I best known me. for, I think. Um, and at least from the first book of those, I think I preferred this standalone, which is the 100,000 Kingdoms. Um, so Again, going back to my um, trope for this conversation, there are gods in it. Um, there are three primary gods, um, but one of them has killed another of them and um, enslaved the third. So there's basically just this one sort of authority. Um, but then there are also these demigods who are the children of the three gods who they had before their falling out um, and both in how the protagonist who's a human um, and the demigod sort of exist in that world turns out to be fairly interesting and you learn more about what the relationship was both historically and moving forward with those three um, primary gods but <clears throat> again I think it's interesting how authors take on this idea of these close to omnipotent beings and try to incorporate them into a world that 
um, where humans can still have some power in them. Um, and I think she did a good job with this book um, and I would definitely recommend it. And this one is available, the ebook is available on Overdrive. I do not believe the audio is though. That yeah. is how I um, consumed it. And I would definitely, I think the narrator does a good job. So if the audiobook is available to you, that's also something to check out. I started- Matthew, are these uh, known gods or are these made up, gods that she's made up for her book? So in all the books I have mentioned, um, they are completely made up. Um, okay. In this one, there's definitely, um, it pulls from what a lot of mythologies do where there's a god of light and dark um, and then sort of an intermediary um, are the three for the 100,000 kingdoms. Um, and then in the first book I mentioned by Kel Cade, um, the gods definitely, like there's a god of war, um, a god of nature. So it definitely falls similarly to like Greek mythology, but um, definitely separated as well. Yeah. I did start reading The Hundred Kingdoms. I couldn't finish it because at the time I was very busy. It was on Libby and then it had to go back. So, but what I read was really good and I do want to finish it sometime. And N.K. Jemison, she also streams on Twitch. She streams video games sometimes. So just oh, cool. twitch.tv slash N.K. Jemison if you ever want to watch her. She's, yeah, she's, I follow her on Twitter and she often too. has insightful things to say. But Yeah, I like her. Good she's to cool. know. All right, am I? I'm Your up? turn. Okay. Next slide. Bless you, puppy. To the dragon. Oh, time travel. So we, Linda talked about time travel. And as I said, time travel is my favorite topic. And I think I got into it the most years ago. There was a movie called Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour. And the uh, novel for that was Bid Time Return. I remember that. Yeah. Oh, I own it. It's so good. I just love it. And so he, it's modern times, that, like would have been the 80s at the time. And he falls in love with the portrait of a woman. Well, it starts out with this old woman coming to him. He was a playwright. And she gives him a pocket watch, an old pocket watch, and says, come back to me. And then she leaves. And he doesn't think anything more about it. And a few years later, he goes to this old hotel. And he sees the portrait of this beautiful woman, young woman in her prime. And he falls in love with her. And he becomes obsessed with traveling back in time to see her. And he eventually figures out how to do so. And he wakes up in her time, which is turn of the 20th century, and they have a love affair. And I don't want to give, give it away, but it's probably my favorite time travel story. It, it combines romance and time travel, and it's really well done. The book is excellent, and so is the film. And the author, Matheson, has written a number of sci-fi sort of books. He's a well-known author, writes, wrote for The Twilight Zone. Then Time and Again is by Jack Finney. And that was maybe the 70s or 80s. That I, maybe 80s or 90s that one came out. And this one I really like because he travels back in time as well. And I can't remember how he travels back in time. But his description of that time period, and I believe it's the late 19th century that he's in, was probably the best description I've ever, it's like you were there with him. Highly recommend it. There's a sequel to that one. And I think my one of my other all-time favorites is the time traveler's wife. And he, the time traveler, has this, it's almost like a seizure. Have either of you read it? It's um, yeah. he almost it's pieces of the movie, but I... The movie, don't even bother. Yeah. Not even... I have some trouble with time travel. <laughs> I'll talk about later, but... Don't even bother with the movie. Not even as good, close as good as this book. And he's a, a librarian. So he's a librarian and like you would have a seizure and have no control of it. He has these time travel episodes with no control over it. And oh. he wakes up and it's his, his lifespan. So he doesn't go any earlier than the year he was born or any later than he's going to live, but he could go in the future or the past and he wakes up naked in wherever he is. And then he has to try to figure out how to survive where he is. And in one of his travels, he meets a girl, maybe nine or 10 at the time. And it's his wife. And so he, he travels back in time to her when he's under a lot of stress, but for her, it, she lives a linear life. And so when she sees him for the first time, when he, you know, he's, they've been married for years, she falls in love with him. So it's kind of one of those chicken or egg sort of deals, you know, 
would she have fallen in love with him if he hadn't time, time travel back in time to her? So that one's really well done. And then uh, Stephen King, I'm a big Stephen King fan. And of course he has a book in almost every genre and he still actually writes his own books. He writes every day for four hours, even Christmas. And this one is a time travel. If you could go back in time and prevent the, the assassination of JFK. So a lot of it is uh, him going back in time and he goes back you know, years before the assassination to plan how he's going to do it. But time does not want to be changed and it fights him. And a lot of terrible things happen to him as he's trying to make the change. I believe this was a Hulu series as well. And actually the Hulu series is pretty well done. We have so, it at our library. So when yeah. we reopen. So either, either the book or the movie, they were both excellent. That's it for me. I do want to talk about, I have trouble with time travel because I can't get me too. my mind <laughs> can't get through the concept. Like that Fury Born I was talking about in the first, the first one, it's not present. It's in, in present in the second book, really. Um, and I, I remember complaining to Matthew, I'm like, no, time travel, no. <laughs> but it's so good that I could get through it. Um, I just have this hard concept, like wouldn't time um, – be able to like wouldn't it the future account for any time travel so the idea that you can change time bugs me but you said it was stopping him from doing that so in the in the it's, yes the stephen king one time does not want to be altered and there are things happen so because he goes back a few times to test it out to try things and what he does in the past affects the future but when he goes through again it like it resets it okay so uh if so let's say I go back in time, I make a change. You know, there was one where this girl had been accidentally killed or whatever. He goes back and he fixes it so she doesn't die. And he comes back and she's alive. When he goes in again and he comes back, it reset what he did. That reminds so, me of the movie Source Code by Duncan Jones, which is David Bowie's son. Um, yeah. He did the movie Moon, which is one of my favorite movies, a sci-fi movie. So it fits. Um, but it reminds me of Source Code there with that resetting. And he keeps trying to save this one thing. He's trying to, in the movie, he's trying to stop a terrorist attack. Um, and he meets a girl and there's, it's, it's, it was really interesting. Um, I like Duncan Jones. Um, and most I, time travel, I lost my, I lost my train of thought there. Well, you were saying it, it, the cause and effect and most time travel that I read does have a cause and effect. There, okay. there, I think, or there's can, a paradox or. I can buy it if it splits off to different um, alternate uh, Universe, like parallel Reality. universes. Yeah. Kind of like the concept of the multiverse that scientists have anyway. Um, sort of. Um, like every time you make a decision, maybe something branches off and there's one where you Choose your own adventure. Yeah, I think like when time travel is the central focus of a thing, it oftentimes works better because they build in. These are sort of the rules of this yeah. concept as it exists within the scope of this book. Like can't have this background and not talk about uh, time travel in Star Trek, um, which <laughs> sometimes succeeds and sometimes fails. Um, and like, it's definitely a very common trope. Um, Doctor Who is another big part of science fiction um, that has a lot to do with time travel, but that from season to season and sometimes episode to episode, they just change the rules of because it oh. fits the plot that the creator wants to use. Um, and I think as long as you can get on board with that, it's fine. But there's yeah. definitely a part of me that resists every time in a lot of media where they're like, so we'll just go back in time and change this. Um, me too. It's we a don't cheat want this sometimes. outcome. But yeah. sometimes it does work. And like in that yeah. book, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. And probably in those books, Aaron recommended because they build it purposely in. So they, they think about it. They're, they're smart time travel. Yes. Uh, my favorite Star Trek time travel is Star Trek four when they have to go back and save the whales. Best one ever. Watch that one over and over again. I also, <laughs> my problem with it was actually kind of addressed in the twilight zone, the episode where they go back to kill Hitler. Yeah. And they kill the baby, but it's not. Was that twilight zone? I remember it wasn't that Hitler. Zone. It wasn't Hitler. It didn't, or it turned out not to be, it, it actually created him rather than destroying him. Oh, uh, yeah. See that? So you get a lot of that bad that's stuff. That's where that the future is anticipating the time travel. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense in my brain. I've seen that too. I like that. I'm pretty sure. Well, that, I'm going to look up the exact episode, um, but you can go on while I look that up. Okay. Matthew? So there is a little bit of time travel. I've So 
the idea that things can influence time is at least brought up in this. I don't recall that there is actually time travel in um, my last book, um, but Four Roads Cross by Max Gladstone, um, again, dealing with gods. And in this instance, um, humans have evolved in such a way that they are able to use what's called craft um, and actually be able to um, not only compete with gods, but sort of become almost gods themselves. Um, so at the point where all five of the books take place, um, the gods are in almost a um, defeated role, like some of them do still exist, but they are not anymore the power that they used to be. And those that have um, continued to exist sort of do so um, at the behest of the now wizards who have a specific name in this that I am forgetting, um, but they sort of the set up- The first one too, and I can't remember. They sort of set up um, the rules for how you're going to interact. And the interesting thing about this book is it takes almost a legal view of magic where everything is based on contracts and even gods have contracts with their followers where I'm going to provide these miracles for you and in return, you're going to pray to me. Um, and I like that. They yeah, can it be was like, very well implemented. They can almost be bought and sold on like a sort of stock market. Um, and like you can have bad accounts like you didn't provide enough miracles this week so you're no longer a soluble company i'm going to come in and um basically devour whatever power made you a god um and you'll cease to exist um so it's interesting it happens like after this great war between the gods and the craft users um and each of them almost has an element of like a mystery to it where there's a given case. Um, so in this one, it's actually that a God has come back to life in Four Roads Cross um, that they thought had been completely destroyed. But because um, her portfolio or set of powers or whatever you want to call it had been absorbed by other people upon her death, like they were bequested to others she now can't really exist in this world until she like recovers those things but also because she didn't die it's sort of a bad contract that um their these powers were sold on the open market so it's an interesting take i think on a lot of ideas and like it definitely deals with a lot of themes in our world like um, how re resources are allocated and how um, in the search for individual power and prestige, um, the state of the world can be forgotten. Um, like there's a lot of talk about how these craft users like destroy the climate of the world they're in, in the pursuit of their own personal goals, which are oftentimes very vain and um, individually driven like they want to be they want to live forever um so yeah that, i would again recommend this book and um this one is not available on overdrive um but if anyone wishes to purchase it from innisfree the link is on this page now there's something with the weird with the order of these is this the first one i read the first one that was published i think but it's also not the order that they're in yeah, so each of the title has a number in it, which is the um, historic time within that given world that it takes place. So historically, this is book four of five, um, as far, but it's actually the last one that was written. And the first one that was written, I believe, is like three something or other. So it's actually third in the series and like each of them are their own individual mystery um but the character there are some recurring characters not necessarily in every one of the five but like this one for instance goes back to the um first published book the characters who are yeah i recognized her on the cover yeah and the um, gargoyle so it's very weird and again i think that is one of the strengths of this genre that 
if done well, you incorporate a ton of weirdness, but are also not so like there's a cogent storyline that you can really attach to while at the same time embracing sort of the weirdness that the author wants to bring. Hey, is it my turn? I, I think so. It is. So I'm going to talk about my favorite. Uh, is that Lily in the background, Linda? Yes, she might have to go to the bathroom right <laughs> after this. I, that's why I kept muting myself during your speech. <laughs> She's making little gremlin noises. That's my dog, Lily. Okay, so uh, the one that got me really big into science fiction, uh, I had always loved it and stuff, but um, in college for my gender and science fiction class in Plymouth State University, we read The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin. Ooh, ooh, and she just recently passed away. Um, this was written in 1969 as part of the, all these women are coming out and writing really great science fiction for the first time. And uh, it's, this one's considered feminist science fiction, but it's, it's for everybody. And um, she writes a lot of genres. She writes some young adult books series. And anyway, in this one, I don't know if you can hear the, the road work outside my window, but um, <laughs> in this one, it's kind of, it takes a place from the point of view of an anthropological, uh, anthropo an words hard today. Anthropologist. Anthropologist is a man who travels to this planet where they have a different culture and the beings don't really have a set gender. They, based on whenever they may or or anything they switch based on like could be different every time and he's trying to struggle to understand this from our culture where we have like the really set and rigid uh, views and it's it's interesting to view it from an anthrop i like how she did it from an anthropology an anthro oh my god i can't say that word today anthropological perspective point of view. yes from an anthropologist <laughs> there we go um when you're thinking too hard about it it's really hard to say um and there's actually some like letters and it and then there's uh, you know how we were talking about how some stories how they said it from letters and diaries there's some of that but then it also goes into the minds and he can becomes really close with this one person who lives on the world and there's also some like a fantasy feel to the world because there's political intrigue almost Game of Thrones ish and then they they travel along this long icy road and they become really close to the trauma and I do want to share um, this really cool uh, 70s cover because it's the best came from my dad's store and I that's still my favorite book to this day uh, she did make a series from it um, this one's not the first one in order but it's the first one that was released in the 60s I would recommend starting with this one they're called the Hanish cycle or Han Hanish um, and at that time there's a lot of science fiction written from that anthropological uh, perspective uh, I read another one um, this is actually from 1991 though, but it follows that same theme. It's called Woman of the Iron People by, uh, where, where is the, Eleanor Arneson. And that one's really interesting too. And it follows that same kind of theme. This is one where they're traveling, but they're traveling not fast travel, fast travel. I just played some Borderlands earlier yesterday. Um, not the speed of light. So they're traveling from their planet to, uh, this planet very far away so they know that everyone they know and love is kind of going to be dead they don't know what earth is like they can't really make contact so they have to make this decision like we're not supposed to interfere with this culture on this planet but since we don't even know if earth exists as we know it do we try to make a life here and interfere and give them culture uh, civilization you know so it's a really interesting dilemma there and there's all kinds of different cultures there's different countries there's china america um all of them and uh it's them working together to kind of uh um make that decision which is a crucial decision they don't want to ruin the culture that they're they were supposed to sit there to study but they also heard rumors from when they woke up from cryo and stuff that earth has had some sort of collapse so they don't know if it's there or not so that that was really interesting i actually didn't mean to bring that one up but it just kind of came out so that sounds good yeah yeah. But Ursula Le Guin, uh, Left Hand of Darkness is a classic, um, classic science fiction, but it still holds up today. And I also think, let me just check real quick. You can watch American Masters for free on PBS. They might still have her episode up because she recently passed away. It's either American Masters or the other one. Um, there's another PBS series. 
I have them linked on our blog posts of cool things, resources online, but there's a lot streaming there. And I think her episode is still there if you'd like to watch it. Yes. It's a big loss in science. I think I would like to watch that. Yes. It is American Masters. Okay. I don't know if it's still streaming there. Uh, I'm not sure. Ursula. I'm sure you could find it. Yep, it is still streaming. So you go to pbs.org, search Ursula Le Guin, and there's a page about her, including the a link to the full film. So there we go. So How are this, we doing on time, Matthew? I was thinking, I was just going to say this <laughs> went a, a little longer than I was initially um, planning. Like this was supposed to be just a little teaser thing, but it turns out there's a lot to talk about. Um, there there is. is so much. And there's so many more slides. We could save it for the next time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, Matthew can explain what we're planning to do with this. Yeah, so we are going to um, put this up on YouTube, I think, initially, and then um, link to it on our social media um, to just try and get the word out that we are creating content um, and also moving forward if other people from the community want to be involved in this talk. We're also going to include some other genre talks um and yeah we hope to get the community involved in this yeah so if you're interested in joining us for the next uh maybe science fiction club maybe uh, other genres you can uh we won't be recording those we'll only be recording the staff ones so just want to point that out so if they're hesitant to join because they're like oh i don't want my face yeah so they, they if they're interested they should email you Math matthew right matthew at meredithlibrary.org <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Thank you. Matthew, thanks for putting this together. It was a lot of fun. I could that talk was fun. all day. I, I had too much fun. I, we went over time. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. All right. Have a good right. one. Bye-bye.